hello real quick, just say hi, just to make sure we can hear each other. Say hi. Hello folks. Hi. Hello. Say hi. Hi. I love your hat. Oh, can, you all, can you all hear every panelist? Okay, we're gonna leave this as like an area mic to catch all of us. Hooray. Perfect. <laughs> but we will get started. <laughs> Hi everybody, my name is Camila and I'm the president of the San Gabriel Valley LGBTQ Plus Center. Uh, and today we have a panel surrounded around uh, coming out and queer futurism. So today's panel is curated from some amazing folks in the San Gabriel Valley. And so I'm just gonna read a brief bio from them and then we'll pass the mic to each of them to introduce themselves. Um, so today we have, to my left, uh, all, over, all over to the last, we have Antonio Reyes, who is the current organizer for the Art Queens Collective and one of the newest board members with the San Gabriel Valley LGBTQ Plus Center. Uh, Tony is a queer identified self-taught artist, born and raised in Los Angeles, San Gabriel Valley, in the city of La Puente. So if you know LP, give some noise. <laughs> with a passion for public health and community organizing, uh, growing up in the area considered a resource desert and with a few LGBTQ spaces, Tony was inspired to build spaces under the Art Queens Collective that bring resources and local creatives together, particularly for the LGBTQ plus and POC community. Uh, Tony's art is inspired by nature, animation, and a touch of politics. Um, and then we'll move it over to Kathleen. Um, Callie is a sophomore at Chapman University. Give it up for Chapman. Uh, majoring in religious studies and philosophy. Yes, round of applause for Callie today. And then last but not least, we have Kenny, Kenneth Rotter, also known as Kenny, with the San Gabriel Valley LGBTQ Center Board of Directors. And Kenny's fun fact is Kenny fosters pit bulls on their free time. So if you are ever curious and seeing a cute pit bull picture, please ask Kenny. <laughs> or if you want to adopt a pit bull, if you want to foster a pit bull, I'll hook you up. I'll give you a good one, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll pass the mic over from this direction over. Uh, Tony, could you, uh, in this current state of affairs, for all you panelists, in this current state of affairs, could you talk a little bit about what grounds you in the day-to-day, -day, in this ongoing movement? What, what keeps you grounded? Yeah, um, it's gonna probably sound a little redundant because it does go back to community for me. Um, once again, this area doesn't have many queer spaces. Being an artist myself, there aren't many art spaces and art-focused spaces. So for me, a lot of my grounding is my art and trying to connect with community. Um, connecting with Camila over the last few years and working together to build, continue building spaces. Um, it, it really is, uh, I don't know, a little corny perhaps to hear it over and over again, but when you are from an area where these things are just not present, they don't exist, um, I really do find myself like connected with myself and grounded with myself when these spaces actually manifest. For example, with the recent art gallery that we put together that's in display till the end of the month and next Friday, shameless plug, we're gonna have our closing celebration with some drag queens, some performers, resources and everything. We'll hand out the flyers in a little bit. But <laughs> coming to like the beginning of October, Camila and I are looking at the center and it's like, wow, that feeling of filling a space up with a bunch of art from queer folks from all of the county and a lot from the San Gabriel Valley and being like, this has never existed out here. Mm -hmm. And when you see it all, and these are artists that are also not very well known. Um, the LA art scene is really big, but when you're talking about artists that are kind of just trying to get some exposure, it's a little difficult. Um, and bringing these opportunities, and even for ourselves, because Camila and I are artists, um, it's when it's like, <sighs> so rewarding. This is why we do what we do. And yeah, it's not just the art, but bringing the art also. Thank you for that. Ah. Let's pass the mic over to Kim. Um, I think for me, especially with all of the political stuff that's been going on, and tensions not only within like queer spaces, but just within spaces of oppression in general and intense conflict, on 
college campuses, it's been really important just to be uberly outspoken and like overtly present. And so I get a lot of grounding and comfort in people just being authentically themselves and not feeling like even if I disagree with them or they don't respect, you know, my identity, my community, at least we're all being honest. And I think that that honesty is really helpful, especially because it allows us to learn. And I think education is incredibly grounding for everybody. And even if we don't find common ground, at least it allows us something that we can connect with and at least understand as we're all learning, we're all growing, and not everything will be understood by everybody, which is all right. And I think I've gotten used to that feeling. But I think, especially community, as you were saying, and just having people showing who they are, being who they are, is incredibly wonderful, especially within a community of so many young people who kind of need older youth telling them that they're allowed to express themselves especially within religious standpoints. We only have one progressive club on campus for people who are Christian and a part of the LGBTQ um, community. So it's been really difficult to kind of get that movement going. We have one Jewish community who's now working with us, but it's a lot of work, but it's nice to all be learning together. Um, I think just what grounds me, uh, especially in this recent times, or people like yourselves. Uh, throughout the panel today, I'm probably gonna talk a lot about the nuances between um, Christians and then people who claim to be Christians. So I think that's very important. Uh, also, like, I'm a queer Jewish man. So not only am I dealing with homophobia and biophobia, like anti-Semitism is still the number one hate crime in the United States. And most of the time when I am confronted by some sort of anti-Semitism or uh, homophobia, it is by people who are claiming to be Christian. And so I think what grounds me is seeing people like yourself seeing a religious um, place like this, having these events and saying, no, we are actually gonna walk the path of Christ. We are actually going to be accepting of all people and we are not going to misconstrue his words to spread hate. So those are the type of things um, that ground me and make me uh, optimistic for the future. Thank you all for a yes, round of applause for the time. And thank you all for really also talking about um, the navigation that takes place in terms of acceptance, navigation in terms of, of uh, being out, and also navigation in terms of like education and miseducation, right? Where, where our values continue to grow um, and as we're continuing to become a larger community, we see where certain problems still currently persist. And so I think that's a perfect segue into our next story, which I really want us to take us, take us back to yourselves and your own journey of coming here today and your own LGBTQ plus story. Um, if you could close your eyes and see yourself on the early days of coming out, uh, what would you tell this individual that you're seeing in your image um, is there a lesson that you know now that you wished you had learned then? We'll start at the end and we'll come back. No. Um, <laughs> um, I officially, like, I guess publicly came out only about two years ago. I'm 39 years old, so do the math, 37. Um, so there's nothing I would really tell 37-year-old me as opposed to 39 year old me. Now if I could go back to 18, 19, 20 year old me when I was realizing, oh hey, dudes are hot too. Um, I probably would have said, I probably would have shoved myself towards more queer friends and more accepting groups instead of, I mean I was born and raised in Arizona 
so not the most uh, open-minded of communities. Um, but, so yeah, I would have told myself, come out sooner, because it would have probably saved me a lot of just emotions. But I never felt like I could. I never felt safe enough until moved out of my hometown, moved to LA, got out of some toxic relationships, and finally I was just like, I'm not going to pretend anymore. Like, this is who I am, and whether I'm dating a man or a woman, like, being queer, being bi is a part of who I am, and it needs to be recognized in this relationship. I can't be hiding this part of myself, or else you're never gonna get the full me. So, educating my mother has been fun. <laughs> I, I called up my mom before I came out on social media, and I said, hey mom, just so you know, I'm bi. And her response was, well not right now. <laughs> and I'm like, no, no, it's kind of a 24-7 thing. It's kind of always happening. Um, Is that on sale? No. <laughs> no. So yeah, that's, that's, that's what I would tell myself. Come out early, come out often. Mm -hmm. That come out often resonates a lot with me. Yeah. It's, uh, as, as I, I apologize for taking up all the time. Bisexual guy in a mixed orientation, straight presenting relationship. So most people default to I'm straight. And then if I'm not with my partner and I mention that I'm queer, people default to I'm gay. So I am coming out on, if not a daily basis, a weekly basis. It's exhausting. Mm -hmm. Just assume everybody's pan. <laughs> <laughs> on the other end of the journey, how has your story been? Can you speak a bit about yours? For me, I kind of came out as by kind of, I guess it was like a soft open. It's not, I think a lot of um, people my age don't really go like, oh my gosh, everybody, I'm gay now, because we, we want it to not be a big deal anymore. And people who are older than us and all the other generations have kind of paved the way for us to be able to come out how we want to and to like change the format of how we'd like to come out. And so a lot of my friends growing up were kind of playing with different ways of coming out. So one of my friends drew a picture and was like, ah, hmm? And I was like, oh, okay, good, love that. And we all kind of surmised from that drawing, like, oh, and they're also in the community, fantastic. And so I was around people who were constantly in a space of acceptance and lovingness. And it doesn't hurt that my parents, you know, throw events like this. I mean, really so hard when my parents are this accepting. So I came out to my parents, my mom was cooking something in the microwave, and I'm like, by the way, just casually, I think I'm bi. And she went, oh, is that new information? And I was like, I think so. And she's like, is that new to you or to all people? Like, do other people know? And I was like, oh, I, I don't know. It's a phenomenal question. And so it kind of, that was the end of the conversation. It was like, oh, fantastic. Did you need to talk about that? Did you want the food I'm making? Oh, great. <laughs> and, so, and so it is on a daily basis, like conversationally, because I present quite straight. I don't know if you could tell, um, but I'll be in conversation and I seem very hetero, very straight, like an ally. And I have to constantly tell people, no, I'm actually bi, but thanks so much. Um, for assuming I'm straight, apparently. Um, I agree. I think it would be best if we just assumed everyone loved everybody. And I think it's odd, and at least from a Gen Z perspective, like, that we have to have identities, that we have to have labels and come out, because like who I'm making out with is really no one's business at the end of the day. And except I'm the person you're making out with. Exactly. Except the, <laughs> except the person I'm making out with. So, <laughs> Is that good with you? But for every every other person I'm hanging out with, it's not like something I 
thing that really matters to me in terms of like how they talk to me, because I'd rather it not be a big deal. I'd rather our queerness be able to get to a point where people, we don't have to fight as hard anymore. We don't have to push so hard because everyone will just be in the state of what we are right now. Like we all came to this event and we didn't have to go around like, oh, are you, which one are you? Are you this one? Are you this gay? I'm this gay. Oh, hooray, hooray. <laughs> and so I think we're getting to communities, getting to spaces where as a larger global scale, we can start seeing a shift, at least from the younger generation of how we come out. And so my journey was not like, as most people's was, because it was so paved so wonderfully for me. It was a lot easier because of all the older generations that had it a lot worse and really took the brunt of all that pain and all that suffering for my generation to do what they wish they could have done. And so, thanks. <laughs> uh, I just wanted to, you said something like, I love that the younger generation is like, it really shouldn't matter, labels shouldn't matter, where I'm like, no, I am this label and I love this label and I want everyone to know I'm this label. Because, I mean, but also it took me probably however old you are to get to that point where I was comfortable saying it. And so now I'm like, no, nah, man, this is my flag and I'm gonna, this is my shirt and I'm gonna do everything and I'm gonna wear my gay shoes and I'm gonna wear my gay shirt and I'm gonna wear my gay hat. Kenny, can you tell us what your shirt says? By Sarah Tops. <laughs> it's a dinosaur that goes both ways. I'll pass the mic over to Tony. Yeah. Um, what can I tell my younger self? I feel like, similarly, I would I would have liked to come out a lot sooner because I think it would have helped my parents help me navigate. Um, because I, I learned coming out that my parents love me, regardless of who I am, regardless of us being a very strong Catholic household. Um, Mexican family, Catholicism, very, very strong beliefs. And I just didn't talk about a lot of things with any of my family because I already thought, like, I'm going to hell, like, why bother telling them? Like, I'll just live my life. I am screwed either way. Like, let's just enjoy myself. And I think by not talking about things and allowing, like, this confusion and, like, this self-deprecation to manifest is where now as an adolescent, when that was the case, um, like, I had a lot of animosity towards the world um, and just really didn't value myself. Um, so here I am these days organizing pop-ups and having my parents tipping the drag queens and giving <laughs> money to my cousins to tip them and it's like, ah, you were so mean to yourself when you were young, like if only you just came out so much sooner or started these conversations, um, but Nonetheless, we are all here thanks to our previous experiences. Some of them might have been difficult, but if we're not finding that silver lining and growing from it, is when shucks, like maybe we are being hard on ourselves. But I have found silver linings, and a lot of my family, all my family is very supportive of me and the, like who I am, what I do. Um, I think because they've seen it firsthand, like, whoa, like people do need these spaces. Like, I've, I've had folks from La Puente be like, I didn't know there was anything gay in La Puente. Like, this is the very first space that I came to where I'm like, there's queer folk around me. And like you said, there's generations before you, long before us that have paved the way, little by little, just making it easier and easier, I think, for the next generation. And I have full faith that there's going to be a time when all religions are going to have their queer friendly spaces and churches and whatever temple, center, um, house of their religion. And I look so forward to that. I really do, because it would avoid children feeling the way I did when I was a kid, um, where it's like, ah, I'm confused, let's just make these mistakes, like, what does it even matter because, like, my family doesn't like me or they don't really love me for me, they love 
what they do with religious households, and they don't need to feel that way. They don't. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what I would tell my younger self. <laughs> Talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all for not only speaking about uh, navigating a relationship to yourself, but also navigating a relationship to a, a changing society that in many ways the story of coming out has changed time and time again. Um, even for myself as someone who's uh, a transgender 29 year old female, I, I've come out twice in my lifetime. Once met over a decade ago as gay and um, a little over t eight years ago now as trans and navigating that identity to getting here, definitely thinking about the lessons you all shared or, are things that I've had to learn. And I think the most resonance was the being mean to yourself. Um, and I'm sure there are folks in this room who also maybe resonate with um, navigating relationships to yourself and people around you. So I thank you all for being here, for, for being able to navigate that, because we're here and we're powerful. And um, let's move to the third question for today, because I want us to think a little bit about the future that we have in front of us, this um, like unimaginable, but in many ways attainable future that we can that we can all come together with. And so, uh, for today, I'm curious, what's something that you vividly imagine the future of our LGBTQ community looks like? Are there certain songs that you listen to? I'm looking at your Kesha band, Kenny, or are there certain people or descriptive words or poems you? share that help you imagine this queer future. We can start this way and go back. Well, like I mentioned, I'm going to probably bring it back to like what I do. Um, and reflecting a lot on the opening reception that we had at the art gallery we recently curated, we did have the YWCA, YCA, right? Um, they had some representatives there and uh, really it, it kind of gave me a glimpse of like, that's what I see as queer futurism, and that's actually the name of our art gallery. It's these spaces where I think folks can find their spiritualism through whatever facet it might be. Maybe just coming to a community event and being able to connect with community, but also having different denominations there, because somebody might find their spiritualism through a certain denomination. And being able to share space together, regardless of like which denomination we might be from, sometimes they don't like sharing space with each other is where I mean sharing space even with other denominations would be like, whoa, like how beautiful is it that here we are creating community not just within the queer community so that folks realize that they have support, that there is people there for them, but then also perhaps not realizing my family is this denomination and I feel like I'm not accepted or I'm not accepted in the church my family goes to, but there are churches within the denomination I practice where I will be accepted. I am loved and I can push the love that I have for myself and for the community within the church that I practice. So for me, queer futurism, I just envision it being everything, not just queer community, it's religion, it's mental health, it's also just speaking about the things that perhaps we're afraid to talk about. So having Planned Parenthood here, for example, like it's it's not like we're trying to promote lifestyles that could be put people at risk on the contrary these types of resources exist because we're trying to minimize risk of STIs HIV um, sure let's say unwanted pregnancies um, because it's it's really about health it's not about trying to create risky behaviors it's, it, these centers and these resources manifest out of risky behaviors, not vice versa. Yeah, I think um, that's true. Queer futurism for me, that's community in the future for me. Mm -hmm. Thank y'all. I think 
for me, like I touched a little bit on it about coming out and kind of how we're changing the language of that. But also just as someone who's in college and is trying to figure out a career and all these other things while I'm a part of this community, a lot of what I hope for your future is that we stop oppressing each other within our own community because it's really tiresome to have to combat oppression from people who are outside of this space, outside of this loving community, and while we're still attacking ourselves, while trans people are still being attacked by other parts of our queer community, while people of color in our community are still being attacked by the white people in our community. It gets really, really tiresome. Mm -hmm. Exactly. No, thank you. Exactly. It's everyone playing this idea of like, well, now that I've gotten this amount of power and I'm glad I have this amount of power, I get to inflict that power on other people. And it's really difficult. And I think once we break that down and say we're all at the same spot, there's no part, like partiality here. We're all in the same community. It'll get a lot better. It'll get to more common ground and allow us to be more open to those who disagree with us because we're not attacking each other so often. I think also, as you were saying, pairing with religion, more religious spaces, especially those who are Muslim, making sure that they are a part of the conversation. There are so many open and affirming groups who are Muslim, who aren't a part of the conversation due to anti-Arab conversation, due to anti-Islam. And I think when we pair everyone together, it gets us a lot better and to a more educational spot where we can learn from each other even if we disagree. It's very similar to this denomination where there is disagreements, there is a lot of spectrum in belief. And that spectrum of belief allows people to find their own faith journey, to find their own personal beliefs within it, which I think is really pertinent to the queer conversation that we're seeing right now, is having your own queer journey and not having to reflect each other's. And we all have our own distinct queer journeys because of people who came before us and because we need to learn and educate from each other. And I think that that's really important. So having those communities educate each other and stop attacking each other so we can be a combined unit against other oppressive forces who are using things that we find sacred, like the Bible, to oppress people because they cherry pick quotes or they use incorrect translations that aren't accurate to the actual text. So once we're all together, it makes it much easier for us to push back on people who need love and I think the question of like what songs and what poems relate to queer futurism, Give Yourself to Love by Kate Walsh is an amazing song about just opening people's hearts to love, letting love into your life. And I think that mindset is also really good, not holding any grudges against other communities because we've been so oppressed by them. Because having that animosity at times can create a barrier even more than there already is. And then also the obvious Lady Gaga, my, my savior, I love her. She's actually a preacher in my head, um, but born this way and Kate Walsh is give yourself to love together, I think really do pave the way for not just pure futurism, but just a loving future in general. Um, I actually am quite optimistic, especially when I hear the younger generation talk about how orientation is not really a big deal for all of them, and how it's just, okay, great, moving on. Um, I, I love that vision of the world. Uh, I think it's awesome. Um, what else? I had some other stuff, but it's all kind of... I'm just kind of overwhelmed with what everyone is saying. I would like to see more bisexual representation in mainstream media. Mostly, like, yeah, they'll hint at it, but they'll never use the term bisexual. Uh, I think the first time I ever remember hearing that was this year, watching Red, White, and Royal Blue. If you haven't seen it, wonderful film. Um, but, yeah, like, I... 
for example, like Buffy the Vampire Slayer, Willow comes out as gay in the later seasons, and her being gay completely negates her relationships with Xander and Oz from earlier seasons. Like, if she's bi, then it kind of makes more sense. I'm sorry, that's getting more into the weeds than I wanted. Um, <laughs> but if we want to talk um, songs or anything like that, there's a great playlist on Spotify called Bisexual Anthems. One of the main songs on that is called Bisexual Anthem. <laughs> it is phenomenal. Um, if also, if you want to just bawl your eyes out, there is a song by Ray Bell called The Village. And it is a song he wrote for two uh, trans kids who are now grown. Um, but the lyric is, you know, there's some lyrics, but it's, there's nothing wrong with you. There's something wrong in the village. Um, I'm getting a little verklempt thinking about it. Uh, so yeah, um, take, a, take a listen to some of that stuff. It's wonderful, it's beautiful. Oh, also anything by Muna or Shallow Pools. If no one's heard of Shallow Pools, they're incredible. They just released their first album last week. It's wonderful. They're from Boston. Don't hold that against them. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all for sharing, and I feel called to uh, also ask the audience to participate on this closing part. We're gonna say three words together, um, and so I'm gonna say it, and you're just gonna say it back. So the first word is power. So say it back, power. 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 Love. Love. Knowledge. Knowledge. Thank you all so much for coming to today's panel, speaking a bit about coming out, queer futurism and representation. Uh, we do have a quick moment maybe for a question. So does anyone have any um, pending questions they'd like to ask for our panelists before we close out? Go ahead. Uh, just kind of going over your broad spectrum of coming out, what, I don't know if you want to ask this do you agree that your future inevitably would say that when you come out, it won't be a big deal? You'll hear, oh, she got married to her, he got married to him, and oh, they got divorced with no big problem. It's simply any spectrum of diversity would be treated as, you know what, they're human. Oh, she, she did it her with her, so the person got the married, they got divorced. She's going out to another girl. And, oh, my, oh, yeah, my son's gay. Do you want to meet him? Oh, yeah, like, you spoke to him. If you guys eventually see that happening, not just simply within California, but in all parts of America, because here in California, we're the diversest type of people here with the best possibilities of, hey, we have lots of connections. But talk about Nevada, Arizona, Mississippi, I mean, go to South Dakota, and the yeah. middle. But, and but there's the big. At least in the United States, there will always be certain parts where coming out will be a big deal, it could be dangerous. Um, we like to think, oh, California is a blue state. It is not. It is a few blue cities surrounded by red. Like, you're telling me that somebody wants to live in Blythe, down the street from a state prison, they're gonna feel comfortable coming out? Um, Maybe not, I mean, I see eventually, like maybe 50, 100 years when that happens, but then what about the rest of the world? You got places where it's still illegal to be gay, to be queer, um, to be not whatever the state religion is. So we're so fortunate to to be in a place where, yeah, we might face a little pushback, but it's nothing compared to um, other cities, other places, things like that. So I do think we'll get there, but I don't think it's gonna happen in the time frame we want. Thank you for your question. Are there any other pending questions, or does any Is other person want to chime in? I think, from my perspective, Growing up in the Midwest, I was born in Missouri, moved to Kentucky, moved to Indiana, and then I moved here. Um, I think we're not going to really see any change quickly. We're not going to see any change on a large scale. But I think right now there's small pocket movements 
of young regenerations and communities like this within different states. I know in Kentucky, there's a lot of different communities. In Virginia, there's a lot of communities. And in Indiana, especially in Indianapolis, I cannot speak for Ireland, live in Newcastle, probably not. But in large city areas, there are groups who are like us, where we're breaking the boundaries, where it's not a labels game, and it's more so just acceptance from a base level. And I think that's how we'll see the growth, is we'll start to recognize communities like us. We'll see that happening. And it's our job to protect each other, no matter where they are, and to support those movements. And we come from, right now, we're all supporting each other. We're pairing with a lot of different groups. And especially for this event, it's multiple groups coming together. And I think if we continue to do that across other states and throughout our country, if we can get to a spot where all these movements are supporting each other and helping each other grow financially and educationally, it might start spreading into other areas like New Zealand and Australia, which are quite lovely. Maybe, you know, maybe they'll do it before we do. But we'll see. I think that's how it'll happen, those in the small pocket spurts, where we all have to kind of band together and recognize each other. I, wanted, I did want to add to this, because you made me think about um, the, the need for movements in small pockets, but also need for movements in all types of areas. And so this year, the San Gabriel Valley LGBTQ Center hosted the first San Gabriel Valley Pride Tour, which was a total of eight flagship events and eight satellite events, a total of 16 throughout the San Gabriel Valley. and. Um, it was in cities like Pasadena, cities in Altadena, Monterey Park, Alhambra, but all of these different cities that traditionally have Pride events were for, for the first time interconnected. And it was um, estimated to have brought 10,000 individuals. And thinking about the San Gabriel Valley, specifically even today being in Covina as an area that traditionally doesn't get a lot of pro-LGBTQ plus events or even programs, it feels really great that um, smaller cities are looking to create more things. Uh, did you want to turn over question for you? Well, I can go to the next question. Go ahead. And just a quick question. I'm not sure if you touched upon this locality that you have. Do you have any advice for parents or a family member who has someone in their lives to be a part of the community? I think there's so many conversations of how we can love ourselves better as a group of people, but which are important. But I just wish there were more conversations of how can our loved ones love us and we deserve to be loved. Do you have any advice for being a parent or someone who has something in their family and part of the community? I don't know if any of us are parents up here, at least not of humans, but <laughs> um, I, I definitely have been asked at times, like, by parents, like, what, the question, the question that you just gave, and I definitely think it's not something, like, to pressure upon, like, let's say, that coming out, um, sometimes it's just entertaining curiosities, those questions that perhaps give you the insight that your child might perhaps be within the community. I think it's entertaining those questions because I, by entertaining them and obviously in a warm way, you're showing your child that it's not being shunned, that you can talk about it. Um, and then just really listening to those responses and like I said entertaining the conversation maybe it started off with a comment they had and it's like oh well what do you think about that or if it's a certain artist that they like that maybe is very much just uh, an ally like I don't know Gaga, Beyonce, Taylor, whoever it might be because um, a lot of celebrities I mean a lot of uh, well yeah celebrities artists are very you know, ally uh, in solidarity with the community right now. Being like, oh, like, what do you like about them, you know? And it can, it can go from there. Um, I know it perhaps differs also when there's, um, let's say, uh, non-traditional gender being expressed. I think that's even more when parents are uncertain about how to talk with their child. Um, because it's one thing just to be a queer identity, perhaps gay, perhaps lesbian, perhaps bi, perhaps, heck, let's talk about Pat. But when we're venturing into gender, because gender and orientation are different, I mean, gender and sexuality are different things, 
I think that's also a different topic for parents to have to navigate and intersex folks about what can parenting look like. But probably just a general like advice that I'm sure any queer folk will tell to parents. Um, so when I, I mean, like I said, when I came out to my mother, she didn't react the way I wanted, but she reacted the way my mom was going to react. Uh, one of my big struggles is, it's, it was like one conversation that we don't acknowledge it anymore. Like, my parents don't ask me, you know, how are you and your partner dealing with it? How, how are things going? Um, my niece and nephew, for the first time, my nephew uh, came home from school and was like, to my sister, it was like, do you know sometimes boys marry boys? And so we're having this conversation, um, this just this past weekend, and I was like, well, like, do they know their uncle is bi? And my sister was like, no, we're not there yet. And I'm like, why aren't we there yet? And she was like, as long as you're with Morgan, like, whatever, you're with Morgan. And I'm like, but that is hiding a part of who I am. So I would say just incorporating all of somebody's identity. Um, other more tangible ways I would like my parents and family to react is I am very aware of what, what corporations rainbow wash and which ones don't. Um, I, For example, I do not eat at Chick-fil-A. Um, prime example. Um, but there's these passive aggressive comments that sometimes my parents will make. One time they picked me up from the airport and we passed a Chick-fil-A billboard and my dad's like, oh, it's your favorite restaurant. And I'm like, you don't need to remind me that a multi-million dollar corporation is donating money to restrict my rights. It's not a funny joke to me. Um, so I actually had a friend, he was at a mall with his three boys, and they were like, oh, can we go to Chick-fil-A? And he's like, no, we don't need a Chick-fil-A. And these kids were like four, six, eight, and he's like, we don't need a Chick-fil-A. Why not? Well, they donate money to this, that, or the other thing. And the eight-year-old's like, well, F them. First of all, like, well done, eight-year-old. Um, but it's just, it's, it's that sort of allyship. I would also say that, like, if my parents would read or absorb media that is not necessarily um, heteronormative, like, uh, and so I would say for any parent of a queer child, especially a younger queer child, uh, if they see you reading Gender Queer, uh, which is an amazing comic book, if they see you reading um, Love is Love, which uh, apparently I only know queer comic books, um, <laughs> there's a comic book called Still By that is wonderful. So like, if they see that sort of stuff around the house, it makes it easier to be their authentic selves. And that's what I would like to see from my family. Because I currently don't. Anyone want to adopt a son? <laughs> I'm available. I think going off of that, also from my experience and the experience of my friends who are coming out as gender queer or expressing their sexuality, it's really important that parents and family introduce youth into the queer spaces around them. Because a lot of times, youth don't have all the available information or the access to queer communities that they need. And so just saying, hey, like there's this pride event, is that something you're interested in going to? Would you feel comfortable going, you know, even if they just came out recently, is that something you'd want to go to? Not like, we're gonna go, pop my car, like, would you like to go do that? Is that something that you feel comfortable going to? And just kind of getting them involved in intergenerational spaces of queerness. And to where it's not just them with their friends, figuring out labels, which my friends did on Reddit, not the best place to figure out your identity, I'll be honest. Um, it gets very confusing very quickly on Reddit. Um, but being able to be in likeness space with people who have 
walked this life longer than you have, and parents being supportive and spending money with queer vendors, and it just being a normal thing, I think it's really important. And also, along with the media thing, showing and acknowledging those who are celebrities who are saying things about it being okay to be a part of the LGBTQ community, and which celebrities don't do that, and just allowing for that conversation or bringing it up, especially if a child is like, oh my gosh, I love Kanye West. And then you're like, well, Kanye, blah, 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 blah. And having that prior education because you care. There's also, I think, looking to the past historically in a lot of spaces and learning how it's been done before, especially in indigenous spaces and along the lines of two-spirit. All of the traditions around that have always been very open, very accepting, and very much on that spectrum idea. And I think we can take and learn a lot from different cultures and the history of different cultures and how we are accepting to all people and to kids and our queer friends just by looking at what people have done in the past and how that can influence our future. A huge round of applause for our panelists today. <laughs> You all enjoyed the rest of Rainbow Day. There are a couple more panels and workshops to attend. There are still some resource tables, so please grab some free stuff. And the dessert is in this room, so it's easy to walk to if you're <laughs>